Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IL domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements <clears throat> by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends throughout the cybersecurity and information systems science and technology community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We provide research and analysis services to help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD cybersecurity and information systems, science and technology. Before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You can go to csi.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view the webinar PDF, click here. Second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other, and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you would like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool, which is at the top center of your screen. That is the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A. For the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. If you have a technical issue during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online. Check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. With that said, I'll hand it off to today's presenter. All right, so thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's uh, my privilege to be here with you today. Uh, my name is Michael Dransfield. I, uh, I work up at the National Security Agency within the Cybersecurity Directorate. Uh, a little bit of background about my, my work there. I've been at NSA for almost 34 years. Uh, my background is uh, mathematics. I got hired into the uh, crypto uh, team. Uh, I worked there for a number of years, uh, spent some time looking at uh, devices uh, and real-time operating systems. Uh, and then um, back in 2000, eight time frame uh, had an opportunity to uh, begin to look at how are we from the U.S. government point of view securing uh, critical infrastructure and the, the critical automated systems that um, are being used to control the resources that we rely on for uh, mission execution. And so I've been working there for uh, since then. Uh, I lead a team up at uh, NSA at Fort Meade um, within our cybersecurity directorate. Uh, that's focused on uh, what we're calling mission critical uh, control systems. And so uh, happy to share uh, what we're doing, some thoughts, things we're working on uh, that can support the broader community. Um, I'm a very informal speaker. So if if you have a question, I would love for you to share that question, chat, uh, or even you can interrupt me and uh, share your thoughts with me. I think that'll make the presentation more meaningful to you and probably others as well. So with that said, uh, I will jump right into, and I'm gonna uh, get rid of my picture on your screen, but I'm happy to, to share that more if you're interested and, and, and go from there. So my first slide, here we go. So first thing I thought I would do is um, sort of cover a definition of what are mission critical control systems. And so this a similar presentation was given uh, before uh, National Security Memo 8 was published earlier this year. And so uh, the definition you see here, uh, I'll read it off for those on the phone line. Mission Critical Control Systems, or the acronym we use is MCCS, 
They are information systems owned by or used by the U.S. government, which monitor and or control physical infrastructures critical to the direct fulfillment of military or intelligence missions. And so if you're familiar with the definition of what a national security system is, uh, these mission critical control systems are by definition national security systems. And so that's the point of creating this definition. And uh, it's, it's much more impactful and meaningful once uh, National Security Memo 8 uh, came out. And it's been uh, what we're using right now, working with various parts of the intelligence community, the DOD and the federal civilian agencies uh, who are currently uh, identifying their mission critical uh, control systems. Um, and so then our work here at Fort Meade is to, in support of the national manager for national security systems, uh, work with them to help them to secure their mission critical control systems. Uh, a type of mission critical control system would be <clears throat> the term we're using is mission critical facility related control systems or the acronym we'll use is McFERC. And so McFERCs are one type of mission critical control system. Others include industrial or process or utility control systems. Uh, depending on what office you're from or what service, there are a lot of different uh, names that are used to refer to these types of systems. Uh, it might involve uh, bringing electric power to your facility uh, within your fence line, within your ownership. Uh, it might involve uh, providing cooling. It might uh, involve pipelines. It might involve fire protection. Um, it might involve lighting at certain facilities, it might involve cameras. And so if you think about what is critical to a DOD or intelligence community missions, uh, that can help you to uh, figure out whether your system is um, really falls within the, the boundary of what a national security system is. Um, happy to talk more about that. But down at the bottom of the slide, I give you a link to work that uh, I was involved leading for the intelligence community was the development of an intelligence community standard. Uh, the number for that standard is 706-02, and that was for mission critical facility related control systems within the intelligence community. That standard was published back in 2019, and uh, we have some follow on work that we've been doing uh, through uh, NSA leadership within the IC uh, to develop guidance to support that standard. I'll touch on that in just a few minutes. So anyway, those are the two uh, acronyms that I'll use a good bit in this uh, presentation. So this slide is really to um, highlight uh, the whole point of our work. The, the, the point of our work is not to secure systems in and of themselves, but it is really focused on what mission does this system uh, support and then what uh, mission uh, uh, relies on it uh, and, and, and essentially how, how could a system, a critical control system, uh, if it was uh, used in an unauthorized way or attacked, how could that uh, negatively impact uh, a bigger mission? And so uh, I really like this slide. I, it's, it's taken from a GAO report um, a few years ago, but I've added uh, sort of on the side, the description of, uh, at least within the DOD, how uh, my understanding and my experience, how facility uh, control systems uh, are managed and the oversight for those systems and how uh, more traditional DOD weapons, space, uh, pick your favorite mission and you could decompose it uh, up, up above the facility. A lot of missions depend on facilities. And so then the question is, how are those facility systems, are they viewed, number one, as critical? And then uh, number two, if they are critical, how are they being um, protected, secured, cyber secured? Um, the picture I like is because it gives you an idea of some of the um, uh, systems within a facility that are dependent upon for mission execution and success. Uh, in this picture, you have cameras, you have access control to the facility, you have fire protection, you have HVAC type of systems, you have energy and then, you know, you have elevators and you might say, well, what do elevators have to do with this? Well, there are some missions um, and some facilities that elevators are critical. And if they aren't available, 
uh, there are parts of the mission that would be hindered. So anyway, uh, good picture. Uh, happy to talk more about that. But my point of uh, showing you this slide is to then transition to the next slide as uh, a lot of work is, is happening within the DOD, and maybe uh, some of you are involved in that, of uh, providing more broad strategic oversight of uh, missions from uh, the traditional systems down through the facilities and the critical infrastructure that those missions depend on. Um, I won't go into any details of that in this presentation, but um, I... I'm a strong supporter of this movement to uh, support um, uh, and to, as you decompose a mission uh, from a mission, mission assurance perspective, as you decompose that mission down to critical support uh, infrastructure, uh, facilities, uh, and other uh, critical control systems are often uh, a single point of failure, uh, a concern for a mission resiliency and mission uh, execution success. So um, the, the point of my, my presentation really is, uh, that was an introduction uh, to the definitions and the terms we're gonna use and to sort of the, the, uh, the goal here is uh, so to support mission assurance, mission execution success. Um, and so, um, there's a, there's a strategy that we have developed at, at the NSA within the Cybersecurity Directorate uh, has sort of a tactical piece and has a strategic piece. And so I want to touch on both of those with you today. Uh, I won't provide a whole lot of details. Happy to do that more uh, if you're interested uh, in a follow on to uh, this presentation. So. So the first uh, part I'll call it our, our tactical, uh, what we're trying to do to mitigate vulnerable legacy critical control systems right now. Uh, if you're attending, you've probably uh, read a good bit about um, sort of the information technology, operational technology uh, use within our systems and how uh, operational technology or OT uh, is often um, the turnover rate or the replacement rate for this technology uh, is much slower uh, than for IT. And so you often will have uh, operational technology that's been put in the field uh, that's controlling uh, some resource that you depend on, and it's been in the field for many years. Um, in all likelihood, that operational technology was not built uh, with a, um, it was built with a trust model uh, that uh, is not one that's uh, good good for use in our today's uh, interconnected uh, cyber world. Um, most operational technology has no ability to uh, defend itself from um, from a cyber uh, community that uh, or cyber adversaries that are seeking potentially to uh, cause a negative impact on our missions. And so a great uh, challenge is how do we deal with that legacy operational technology? Uh, from a tactical point of view, uh, there are several things that we have done. Uh, the first thing I'll highlight is a national manager memo that NSA published uh, in uh, spring of 2021. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the solar winds supply chain incident that occurred. Um, it was a, uh, it was a, it was an attack that was done against uh, the, the, the company. Uh, and so the memo was created to provide guidance to our national security system and our mission critical facility related control system community to help them to deal with uh, first diagnose if they had, if they were using uh, certain products, uh, SolarWinds products, how could they detect if they had been attacked and then how could they eradicate uh, that, um, that, that vulnerability within their system. And then uh, in addition to that guidance, the National Manager Memo uh, also provided certain guidelines for uh, the community to, uh, for immediate steps for system owners to take, or at least to ensure that they had in place for their critical, uh, mission critical facility related control systems. The three areas I'll just quickly highlight uh, dealt with boundary, hardening their boundary. <clears throat> so my experience working with <clears throat> a number of DOD clients and customers is they're not really sure where their uh, 
uh, network and system boundary is for their critical control systems. And so if that's the case for, uh, for you, uh, people that are listening, uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, know your boundary. And so it's uh, not only know your boundary, but also harden your boundary for these critical control systems. Uh, second part is there's a lot of shared infrastructure that's used uh, for these uh, critical control systems and other data networks. A uh, number of uh, locations have uh, an infrastructure that's in place that connects various buildings. And because most of these control systems uh, have uh, that are they, they are deemed to be un, uh, so, uh, containing unclassified information or data, uh, they've been treated as other unclassified systems that have all been lumped together in a common network. And so what that has done is uh, that provides a pretty easy access vector into these critical control systems. So the second part of this National Manager Memo of Guidance uh, uh, strongly uh, encourages system owners to uh, provide uh, strong separation between your critical control system and, and other networks. And if you're going to use a shared infrastructure, you need to separate that. Um, if it's not separated physically, it should be separated uh, in a logical way. The strongest logical way would be uh, using cryptography. Uh, I know uh, some organizations use logical separation, which would involve setting up maybe a, a virtual LAN uh, using uh, switching, managed switch technology. Uh, VLANs, uh, from NSA's point of view, are not uh, a strong area level of separation between a critical uh, control system or a critical network and a non-critical network. Um, uh, we, we strongly recommend, if you can't physically separate your network, then providing cryptographic protection and tunneling for your network if it's going to go through a common uh, backbone. The third part of that National Manager Memo dealt with the use of, uh, we call them dirty devices, uh, of moving data from your control system to another network and from that other network to your control system. It might involve patching, it might involve updates. Uh, so the, the memo uh, rec strongly recommended the use of government, government furnished equipment to move data from your critical control system to and from it uh, to other networks and putting other policy mechanisms in place. Um, the mess that this memo was well received by some parts of the, the DOD, and uh, I'll touch on that in a few minutes, but uh, it's been useful for part of the community. Uh, happy, the, the, the memo is unclassified. Um, and so happy to share that if you haven't seen it or interested in seeing it, it is currently being updated uh, in response to National Manager Memo 8, National Security Memo 8, uh, to provide updated guidance to the community uh, for these critical control systems. Second bullet talks about a toolkit that has been developed at in our uh, division at NSA. Um, our experience early on was that uh, a lot of operational technology in, in critical systems, we had no tools uh, capable of uh, safely uh, touching those devices, uh, pulling uh, information from those devices, maybe what configuration the device was in, what firmware version the device was running. Uh, think about other types of certain logs that the device was collecting. We had no tools to pull that data and support analysis. And so uh, NSA, uh, CS, our CSD division, has developed what we're calling our operational tool, operational technology defensive capability suite, uh, or OT toolkit. And so we're currently sharing that toolkit through a technical tool sharing agreement uh, at NSA with uh, government organizations. It's a it's a restricted to government uh, organizational use, uh, but the, the the defensive capability suite involves not only our OT tools that we share, and th these tools. A touch on a number of the OT vendors uh, and their systems, but also standard operating procedures on how to use the tools. And we have a number of what we're calling OT STIGs, uh, Security Technical Implementation Guide, for uh, certain uh, devices that are uh, prevalent across the DoD. 
Um, that's an area we're trying to increase uh, and expand, uh, but currently uh, that's not a priority in our organization at the moment. But all of that is, in, is included in our OT defensive capability suite and can be shared. So if you're interested in uh, getting access to that, you can send me an email uh, or get in touch with me at the end of this presentation, and uh, I'll work with you to, to share that toolkit with you. The third bullet uh, that I'll touch on here from a tactical point of view is from our experience working with critical uh, system owners, um, NSA in the past has published guidance. We have uh, shared certain tools, but when it came to uh, actual systems that existed, uh, from an authority's point of view, uh, we, unless certain agreements are in place, we don't have the authority to touch uh, a system that um, that we don't have the authorization for uh, to change that system, uh, et cetera, to improve its cybersecurity. Uh, what the applied control system mitigation um, methodology process and program was designed to do is to meet uh, National National Defense Authorization Act uh, 1650, sort of the, the intentions of that, uh, which was came out several years ago to help DOD, to direct DOD to, to improve the cybersecurity of their critical infrastructure. And so ACSM uh, was designed to uh, not only identify where uh, we believe are the highest priority, uh, maybe access vectors, unauthorized access vectors into your system uh, and most glaring cybersecurity issues in your system, but then to work with you uh, to help uh, design and work with you to implement uh, immediate changes in your system to improve the, the uh, cybersecurity posture of that system, but also to help you design POAMs that could then help you um, in, in future improvements of your system, uh, potentially helping you to acquire uh, additional uh, budget uh, money to improve your system, things like that. So. Um, Really, the uh, ACSM methodology uh, is designed to support uh, the community in addressing uh, and implementing uh, cybersecurity changes that can improve the, the cybersecurity posture of your system. Uh, we, we, for ACSM, we've written several documents that uh, really uh, guide uh, that guidance that we provide to the community. Um, we have, I mentioned the uh, National Manager Memo. I mentioned the IC706 uh, standard uh, on the previous slide. Uh, we also have been developing what we're calling, it's, it's a technical implementation guide to support the ICS706-02 uh, standard. Uh, that technical implementation guide primarily was created because when we started looking at the, uh, the NIST, if you're familiar with the NIST special publications, 882 Rev uh, Revision 2 was created about seven to eight years ago. And so when we began creating this technical implementation guide, um, the uh, Rev 2 guidance, we believed, uh, was not had not kept up with and was not addressing uh, sort of the maturity of technology uh, that existed. And so as we created this technical implementation guide, uh, NIST has recently been updating their 882 special pub. And so the, uh, the, the TIG that we've developed, uh, version one is completed. It's been reviewed. Uh, it's in a publication process right now. Uh, I'm happy to share a draft of that with you. Uh, we're going to publish it soon and then begin to work on uh, version two. Version two, hopefully, uh, can be a work that we can work with NIST and others in the community to sort of combine that work uh, for the community. Uh, Rev 3 of 882 is in draft form right now. We've reviewed it. We've supplied NIST with comments, and um, I know a number of others in the community have too. And so uh, we'll see when that is published uh, and, and, and how we can leverage that uh, for revision two of this uh, technical implementation guide for uh, critical McFurks. The last bullet I would touch on is we have a number of partners that we work with uh, for our ACSM uh, methodology and the work we do at, at NSA, uh, some being operational technology uh, companies that we partner with to help develop tools, 
that support the OT toolkit. Others uh, we leverage when we go to a site and identify uh, a current uh, systems site. Could be a, their HVAC system, could be their energy management system, uh, f- and they're leveraging Vendor X. And so we have a number of partnerships where we bring in um, uh, Vendor X's uh, lead uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, designer and implementer, and they uh, partner with us and come on site to help provide uh, uh, strong guidance t- for the customer. Uh, and then the customer decides then whether they, if they can, uh, how they will implement that recommended guidance. So that's sort of a summary of the, the tactical work we're doing. Um, I, <clears throat> I see my first bullet at the top of this slide. Uh, I think that's, if, you're, if you work in this community, you realize that cybersecurity is a hard problem it, it not only involves uh, sort of addressing issues with our technology, but it's really, um, you know, the, the term that's the phrase that's used is it's people, process, and technology. So it's the people that run our systems. It's the processes that are used, for example, patching, um, uh, you know, how, how individuals interact with the system and then the technology in and of itself. And so if, if you know, I would, I would propose to the community if, if if this is not something that you already realize that um, we, and I'm, I'm guessing someone this line also, uh, are the, the challenge of uh, hiring uh, and training uh, individuals who understand this critical control system space and know how to cyber secure it uh, is a challenge. And so uh, hiring uh, the necessary uh, individuals, teaching them and training them to understand how, what processes are needed uh, to make a system secure and keep it secure. And then the technology piece uh, is, is an area where uh, I'll touch on in the next slide. From a strategic point of view, things we're doing to uh, support the community's effort to improve cybersecurity built into uh, technology moving forward. So I'll go to the next slide, touch a little bit on some of the strategic things we're doing. <clears throat> I mentioned the... Uh, the ICS 706-02 standard that was published in 2019. Um, we've used that as sort of a basis for the guidance we've provided, not only the IC community, but the DOD and the NSS community itself. Uh, the, the 706-02 standard called out for a security control baseline for these mission critical facility related control systems, uh, which touched on uh, really a moderate impact or a, a moderate, moderate, moderate um, security controls from NIST 800, um, 853. When the standard was developed, we, we moved from referencing NIST to referencing uh, CNSSI 1253. And so we have a set of controls from 1253 uh, that do map back to NIST 853, but include also an, an intelligence community overlay for these types of systems. Um, and so uh, happy to share that uh, baseline with the community. I mentioned the technical implementation guide that we've been working on. One area from a strategic point of view that I've been involved in for five, six years now has been, if you think about how do we uh, get technology, uh, new technology to be available uh, to implement in our systems that has cybersecurity built in. And so I began exploring this problem uh, more than five years ago. And my conclusion was that the operational technology uh, vendor community was pretty heavily involved in a cybersecurity standard. It's an international standard called ISA uh, uh, community and the standard number is 62443. And this standard is it's a multi-part standard that deals with security and maturity levels. And so in getting involved in that, that standard defines uh, cybersecurity uh, requirements for devices, for systems. Uh, it, it defines uh, requirements for processes. Uh, uh, so it, it, it spans the, the gamut of different aspects of cybersecurity that should be addressed for critical systems. And so uh, currently there are OT vendors that are using this 62443 standard. Uh, 
to help them to define their cybersecurity roadmaps for their uh, technology. And so as technology is being built against the standard, uh, the ISA community has, has stood up what they're calling their ISCI. Uh, it's the ISA Security Compliance Institute uh, to do conformance testing on technology that meets the 62443 standard. Um, and I can point you to that. You can also Google uh, ISCI and find uh, technology now that's been tested against the standard. The standard has uh, currently four security levels where security level one is uh, really defines uh, a cyber adversary uh, as, a, as a script kitty or a, a low sophisticated adversary. It goes up through level four, which level four would be the, the highest security level uh, of technology built into uh, cybersecurity functionality built into this technology. And level four would deal with uh, your nation state adversaries who have sophisticated capabilities and tools to, uh, if they uh, if they make a decision and have an intent, they would uh, use those tools to uh, try to impact uh, a critical mission uh, that was relying on uh, this technology to support uh, resources for uh, supporting the mission. And so uh, currently there is technology that's been tested to conform to security levels one and two within uh, this 62443 standard. Uh, I've been working hard to uh, get vendors to build in and uh, have their technology conform to security level three. Again, I'm happy to talk more uh, with, with you if you're interested in this, but uh, from my point of view, having technology on the shelf that has built in security level three capabilities that has been tested uh, by an independent source, it could be ISCI, it could be other uh, test labs, uh, is an option to meet um, the cybersecurity controls that we've created in not only the 706-02 standard, but other, other work that's uh, in process. I will touch on the ASHRAE standards uh, committee. I have a colleague at NSA that works on the ASHRAE committee. ASHRAE, if you're familiar with uh, uh, facility-related control systems, you might be familiar with the BACnet protocol. BACnet is a protocol developed years ago. Again, it was developed in an era where uh, there was no concern for cyber adversaries. And so BACnet has, in and of itself, no cybersecurity built in to that protocol. Uh, it's been implemented by most vendors uh, in their uh, building automation systems. And so ASHRAE, uh, several years ago, began an effort to create what they call um, Secure BACnet uh, or BACnet SC. Um, essentially, what they're doing is they're, they're pushing the BACnet protocol through a TLS tunnel. And so uh, my colleague at NSA and I have been working with uh, and talking to a number of uh, OT vendors uh, to understand better uh, what is their what is their plan? What is their rollout strategy for um, implementing BACnet SC in their building automation systems? And how then to, how do you evolve your current uh, facility related control system or your, your building automation system? How do you evolve that from using a protocol like BACnet, which is not secure, to the BACnet SC version, which does implement uh, cybersecurity and encryption? And so, again, I'm happy to talk more about that if you're interested. The last bullet I'll touch on at the bottom of this page uh, deals with zero trust. And so uh, if, you're, if you're active in this community, in the cybersecurity community at all, you're probably familiar with work that was done, came out uh, at NIST and has been adopted within uh, primarily the U.S. government uh, from executive orders to national security memos to uh, we have zero trust architectures, reference architectures that have been created for uh, data data systems and critical systems, um, but it's it's working its way into concepts or working its way down into uh, mission critical control systems. And so then the question is, how do we bring that in a way that will allow these critical control systems to uh, still provide the availability that they uh, are primarily designed for an, an integrity property, uh, 
not not always confidentiality uh, being driven, uh, but meet the functional requirements, but also how can zero trust and the concepts uh, imp help improve the cybersecurity of these critical control systems. And so we, we have a white paper, we've been developing concepts, we're kicking off a contract uh, within a couple of weeks. Uh, and I can talk more about that once that contract is in place. Um, but I have a couple of slides I want to touch on zero trust uh, and happy to talk more about that. First slide is uh, really what is zero trust? If you're not familiar with zero trust, uh, it has certain principles. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it assumes that there's, your system is existing in a, a hostile environment and we have to assume a breach. Uh, for many years, we have um, tried to harden the boundary of our systems. And by doing that, you know, we sort of made a, a false assumption that by hardening the boundaries, um, we've kept the adversary out. And from a zero trust point of view and from our experience, we realize now that uh, just because we, we hardened boundaries didn't mean the adversaries didn't get in. And so we've had adversaries in our systems, various systems for, for many, many months, even years uh, with us unaware that they were in the systems. Uh, you know, we, we sort of took the uh, approach, if it's not broken, don't fix it or don't even look. And so, um, and that's, that's true in a number of data systems, but also it's extremely uh, accurate uh, for critical control systems. And so assume hostile environment, assume uh, your systems have been breached. What does a least privileged access uh, sort of a approach to giving individuals access or even processes access to certain data in your system, certain uh, devices to change certain cyber physical devices to change uh, something within the physical world. Um, that this is how zero trust, uh, if you think about it, applies down into uh, critical control systems. Uh, persistent engagements. Do we have any visibility or eyes into our systems now? And this is a big push within the community of having at least uh, sensors uh, sharing situational awareness of the system uh, with um, cybersecurity uh, uh, operation centers uh, to provide oversight and visibility into that network. Um, last one deals with uh, uh, multi-factor authentication. And so I'm gonna to touch on MFA in a slide or two, but MFA uh, is, is possible within control systems, but it is it has to be brought into the the uh, critical control system in a controlled way. And so I'll touch on that in a minute. The, the figure down at the bottom of this, this slide um, is, is touching on the, the seven pillars of zero trust. Starts with users and devices, goes through network environment, application and workload, data visibility, and automation. And so um, I won't touch on that anymore at this time. Happy to talk more. Like I said, we have an effort ongoing at our place I know there's a number of folks within the, uh, the DOD community that have begun to develop zero trust strategies for their, their control systems. And so, uh, you know, I, from sitting up at Fort Meade, I think this is, a, this is an area or even a working group that needs to occur uh, within the DOD or the IC uh, to talk about what is a, a common reference architecture for zero trust that can be uh, it might look different uh, at different locations, but has certain foundational principles, uh, security controls, requirements that are needed. And these pillars and capabilities uh, uh, are ones that can help us to define uh, that. The next slide is a slide you might have seen. It's, it's another way of looking at uh, the, the previous slide, but it, it breaks the uh, maturity of your system into various stages. Uh, from a zero trust architecture point of view. And so our 706-02 uh, standard and the security controls in it, uh, we believe uh, are a pre-ZT set of controls that should be put in place in your system. Uh, you see MFA or multi-factor authentication is sort of a, the next step into your basic maturity level for zero trust and least privilege access. Um, 
and we, we can go on from there so that we could spend a, an hour talking or more about this slide. Uh, happy to do that offline or follow on to this presentation. Uh, I think this is my last slide. Uh, just want to touch on uh, sort of what we've been doing at a high level up at, up at NSA. So mission critical control systems, uh, if, if you're familiar with how they're composed and built, they, they utilize both information technology and operational technology um, within an authoriz authorization boundary. Uh, I think I have a question. I, so I'll, I'll come back to your question, Art, in just a second. Um, uh, the zero trust concepts really uh, can be applied right now within critical control systems to uh, the information technology, not so well to legacy OT. And so the concept of rip and replace is not really an option for most of our government critical control system owners. And so at a high level, a concept we're calling uh, OT Access Security Broker or OTASB uh, is, is what we've created to be sort of a proxy between uh, to protect uh, critical operational technology that can't protect itself. Um, a foundation for that gets into uh, sort of a technology software defined networking that has uh, been developed over the last few years and is becoming uh, more common and commonly available for systems. Um, so let's see. So Art has a question. Let me try to figure out how to answer your question, Art. Hey, Michael, I'll, I'll jump in really quick. Um, okay. if, that's, if that's your last slide, uh, we'll start the Q&A session now. I'll, I'll read the questions out loud and uh, present those on the screen uh, for the benefit of those on the phone. And we'll step through them and uh, you can answer the questions uh, for the audience. Okay. All right. Um, so our first uh, question slash comment is from Gary. He says, mm -hmm. everything you said is accurate. You've not yet mentioned a target style attack where the HVAC system allowed access to the mission systems. Right. So I guess my answer to Gary's question would be, um, you know, you could have a scenario where you have the HVAC system connected to the mission system. Usually the mission system's classified, usually the HVAC system is not classified. So those would not be connected. So then the, the question would be, how could an attack on an HVAC system impact a mission system? And so my answer to that would be, uh, again, we're not talking about a specific system. I'm happy to talk uh, with you offline, but in general, if I can attack an HVAC system at a server farm or at a, or at a specific facility that can take out that HVAC system or take it down your chiller, then unless you have a backup chiller ready to go, you're going to lose cooling uh, at that facility. And so, you know, my experience at certain locations where HVAC systems have gone down, uh, system owners have not had a backup cooling plan in place and had to shut down missions at that facility because they could not cool the technology that they were they were using and depending on. Thank you. Uh, our next question from Art. How does your group coordinate to support cross-domain OT data transfer to IT monitoring systems, say unclassified to secret? Good, good question, Art. And so um, this is an area where the customers that we're working with for this specific scenario, um, options include maybe a one-way diode. So moving data. So you, you asked a question about cross-domain OT data transfer. And so this is an area where um, I would say NSA works in the area of cross-domain solutions and provides oversight and guidance uh, and requirements for the community. So in your scenario you're painting, I would say that this would require an official cross-domain solution because you're crossing classification domains. Now within official, the cross-domain solution uh, set of uh, options for you, uh, there, I know there used to be one-way diode options to move data. Uh, so, um, I can follow up with you, Art, and we can look at the, the current 
um, let's say approved cross domain solution options to meet your requirements. Uh, but a data diode uh, solution seems to be the, the best option to meet your requirements. Um, if, we, if you took your question and adjusted it just a little bit and you said, well, how can I transfer data from my critical control system, which is unclassified right now, to, say, a non-critical system, which was also unclassified? Now you're getting into, uh, I would say, a, a device that would not be would, would not be required by at least DOD to be a, an official cross-domain solution. Now you get into other, I would say, what I would recommend would be diode type of options uh, where you have a number of diode vendors now within the uh, OT community that are, that are publishing and advertising their products. Um, so those are two uh, possible solutions I would offer to you, but I'm happy to follow part after this. Thank you. Our next question from John. ZTA requires encryption to implement. Has anyone determined whether CSOT devices have the necessary computational power to apply the encryption requirement without manufacturers having to re-engineer those devices to comply without suffering performance impacts? That's a great question, John. And so I would say that question really uh, leads into uh, the previous slide where I talked about this uh, OTASB or Operational Technology Access Security Broker. And so most legacy OT technology out in the field right now does not have the necessary computational power nor the ability to uh, encrypt data. Um, and so uh, this is where, you know, if you have the concept of uh, uh, sort of push up requirement. I don't, I'm not sure what tech, no, terminology you use, John, but it could be push up uh, requirements or uh, uh, can, uh, let's see, what's the term? There's another term that's often used uh, that, that another part of the system uh, would have to meet the zero trust type of uh, requirements for uh, access control or encryption for uh, low level, say Purdue model uh, zero and one devices that can't provide that necessarily necessary device uh, encryption or authentication of commands in and of themselves. And so uh, this is a great question, John. And the whole point of the OTASB concept that we're creating is to be a stepping stone toward a future where you have uh, operational technology uh, that meets 62443 standards that has been, uh, I would say, uh, tested to meet that standard that does implement the necessary uh, capability to encrypt data if it needs to be encrypted, or at least to be able to uh, authenticate commands that are issued to it, maybe to, um, to authenticate firmware updates before it loads firmware into it, uh, things like that. So there's cryptographic functionality, I would say, that it's not just encryption, but it's cryptographic functionality that this technology can't implement right now. But uh, the effort with uh, the 62443 standard is to uh, really uh, influence uh, the operational technology vendors to build that into their next generation technology. And it's happening right now. And so, um, again, I'm happy to talk more about that. If you want to go to that ISCI website, uh, you can also go to the, uh, there's a company called uh, Exida, E-X-I-D-A, uh, and they have an ISA secure uh, program uh, that you can learn more about this. But anyway, you can send me a note, John, and I can point you to it. Thanks. Next question from Art. What federal mandates drives MCCS cybersecurity mitigation? Are authorizing officials throughout the DOD educated on the requirements? That's another good question, Art. So uh, back to National Security Memo 8 that was published earlier this year. And so uh, if you're familiar with Executive Order 14028, it specifically called out for critical operational technology that had to be, uh, we have to address the cybersecurity issues in our operational technology for critical missions. And so National Security Memo 8 is really an implementation of Executive Order 14028. And so within the National Security Memo 8, uh, a number of tasks have gone out uh, to the community, to the NSS community. Specifically, Task 5 uh, was sent out to the broad DOD, IC, and FedCiv community 
to call for them to identify and inventory their critical systems that uh, meet the definition of a national security system. And so uh, with that task that was sent out, um, we have a number of DOD uh, entities that have come back and said, uh, specifically, we have critical control systems, mission critical facility related control systems that are national security systems. And so uh, the the mitigation guidance, so your question of what federal mandates drive MCCS cybersecurity mitigation, I would suggest that it is the, starting with Executive Order 14028 to National Security Memo 8. And then, uh, like I think I mentioned to you that I'm in the process of taking the existing National Manager Memo that was published last year in response to the solar winds attack, and I'm updating it uh, based on and using the authorities of National Security Memo 8 to, uh, to include the guidance from last year's National Manager Memo, the advisory memo, but include some additional guidance for the community. And so that is guidance for the community, for the National Security System community. Uh, I'm currently having discussions with some in the community on whether their control system is, by definition, a national security system or not. And that's an ongoing discussion I believe we'll have. Uh, but I think it's, it's NSA's role in supporting the national manager to put out guidance that we believe is necessary uh, to mitigate uh, current vulnerable legacy control systems, but also as new systems are acquired or built, uh, what are the requirements for those systems as well? Hope that answered your question, Art. Again, I'm happy to talk more uh, later about that. All right. Our next question from Jennifer. My biggest problem with the zero trust is the requirement for MFA. Being a TSSCI closed restricted network, we can't use DOD PKI, can't use MFA keys or cell phones. What is our way forward? Okay, so Jennifer, when you talk about a TSSCI closed restricted network, uh, I guess I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about. I can share with you that for me in my work at NSA on my TSSCI, I would say a closed network. And again, I'm not sure how you're defining closed and restricted. Uh, we, we've been doing MFA for a number of years. Uh, I have my RSA token. Uh, we also have uh, MFA that we use for our unclassified systems. Um, you're right, we don't bring our cell phones in, but we have uh, uh, MFA keys that we use uh, for um, our data systems. Now, uh, for the NSA uh, critical control system, uh, I work closely with my partner over in our facilities organization. They have been rolling out MFA for their critical control system for all users at all uh, IT host uh, platforms. And so uh, this is sort of getting into the what when I was describing our our approach to uh, zero trust for critical control systems. Um, you know, there's certain OT, legacy OT, that, that can't meet zero trust uh, properties, but there is IT within those systems that uh, I would argue and, and are, are now, at least the, the, there are systems now that I'm familiar with that are beginning to meet MFA in those critical systems. But uh, it's a good question, Jennifer. I'm happy to talk more offline. All right. Um, I believe that is the last question. We do have a comment from Joe that says uh, zero trust poses risk to safety critical functions in NSS cyber physical systems. Uh, for network, ZTA is an effective and practical approach, but for, N for NSS CPS, it is not. I'm not sure if you have a comment related to uh, Joe's most recent comment. Well, so I, I, I appreciate Joe's comment. And my response to Joe's comment is uh, it's a blanket comment. And I would argue that um, each, each critical uh, cyber physical system is often a snowflake. It's often its unique situation. And so I would, I would not say to Joe or anyone in the community that 
uh, you need to do all of these zero trust things and all of your all your critical control systems. They're they're a requirement. Uh, I would say that NSA's responsibility is to identify the cybersecurity controls, uh, the processes that should be in place for critical uh, mission critical control systems. The question then is, how do you apply that to each of your critical uh, unique systems? It could be in the you know, pick your favorite world. It could be in a weapon and space world. It could be in a nuclear world. It could be in critical worlds, cr- critical, I would say, in, uh, missions or infrastructures. And so the question is, how do you supply, how do you apply uh, these concepts into uh, the world that Joe's talking about? So, you know, I, I appreciate Joe's comment, but I don't, I don't think having a blanket, uh, uh, you know, statement that says M- ZTA, uh, doesn't apply uh, to cyber physical systems uh, is is the is the approach to take. But again, I'm happy to talk to Joe offline. Okay, uh, a new question came in from John. As a slash the DoD cyber advisor, does the NSA advocate implementing out of bound access management networks, vice enabling crypto tunnel tunneling into CS slash OT enclaves for management? Yeah, good good question, John. Having 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 the uh, sort of the control plane, protecting it from the actual uh, the the network it's it's responsible for. Uh, strong advocate for uh, separating that. Now, when you say implement out of band, uh, I don't know if you're referring to. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by that. And but this is a great question. I would argue that. Uh, from a from an NSA point of view, from a cybersecurity point of view, separating your your access and management of a network from the network itself is is what I would strongly recommend. Once you get into control systems, uh, this gets into the area of if you're going to tunnel within, I would not recommend control uh, tunneling within a control system itself. But there are certain systems that that might be the only option you have, and if it is, then how do you protect that the control uh, into uh, an access point into that system? All right. So it's just a clarification from John. I'd, yeah. I'd prefer. I'm I'm happy to turn my my uh, video on. And John, can you can you talk to me and? So you're saying separating remote access to the OT from the data transport. Um, when you talk about data transport, are you talking about within, say, a this uh, uh, infrastructure? Is that a yes? I think it's a yes. Uh, yes. So, you know, I, I can't comment on, well, I can't comment, but... Uh, I don't know exactly when you talk about the DISA infrastructure, uh, should you tunnel through that to get to a local base uh, and then control your critical functions within the control system at that local base? I would say there are options that you could explore uh, to meet your requirements. um, But in general, separating the control from the data network is a strong recommendation that I would give you. Thanks Again, John, if you, if you have a specific, uh, you know, um, uh, location or instantiation that you'd like to talk more about, I'm happy to do that. All right. And our last question from Art, what contact information should we use to follow up? Sure. So let me type. I think I can type, hopefully. Can I type uh, my email yes, address in here? Yeah, if you could type it in the attendee chat. All right. So you can send me an email to uh, mrdrans at nsa.gov. And also send one to, uh, I have mrdrans at uwe.nsa.gov our unclassified work environment. We have uh, more rich uh, features and things that I can do in my unclassified work environment. So um, 
Yeah, so you can reach me on either of those addresses. I, I read the NSA.gov more. Uh, and so, um, yeah, it's happy to follow up. You know, our, our team uh, sits within the cybersecurity directorate. Uh, I work a good bit with folks down at uh, CIO. Um, you know, I've talked to and worked with McKay Tolbo for a while. John, I think you're over in ANS with uh, Ken Wang and, and some other colleagues. Uh, again, you know, this is a, as, as you know, this is a hard problem. And so uh, trying to address current legacy systems and mitigate uh, the plethora of vulnerabilities in these systems uh, to me really gets into uh, the, the, the sort of the, the principles that I talked about from the National Manager Memo. A lot of our, our base systems, there is no boundary around your critical control systems. And so you have your critical control system functionality mixed in with your non-mission critical functionality. And so you will never be able to really secure and uh, sort of prevent access vectors into your critical control systems if you have it connected directly and are using uh, you know, one control system across a location for both critical missions and non-critical missions. And so separating that uh, system away, uh, the critical system from the non-critical system is a good first step. Uh, then, then how do you begin to improve that cybersecurity of that critical system? So anyway, I'll try not to ramble. I do sometimes. So um, do we have any more questions uh, today? No, I believe that's it. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll wrap up today. Uh, I would like to uh, publicly thank Michael for sticking with us. We had to uh, reschedule a little bit, um, but this was a this was a great presentation, as can be seen by the attendance as well as uh, the audience interaction. So, um, as always, check back on the CSI website. Um, the recording of this presentation uh, will be up there within a couple of days, as well as on our YouTube website. Um, you have my contact information. You also have Michael's contact information. Feel free to reach out. Um, and we hope to see you all on our next uh, webinar presentation next month. Thank you. All right. Thanks.